it's uh, time to start the 12th episode of the building of the Dancing Feather, Boston Pilot Schooner. And uh, in this episode, we're going to be uh, carving the uh, rowboats that are stored on deck, and we'll rig the lines that would be lifting the boats out and off of the ship. And uh, once we get that done, I think the, uh, once we get the boats mounted on the deck, I think the uh, ship itself is pretty much completed. So the only thing after that will be to build a display case for it. I've made a copy of the uh, rowboats that are stored on deck. And uh, looking at it, I think the best way to do it is to actually carve the uh, boats out of pine. I have a couple of pieces of scrap pine here. And this end of it seems to have some nice grain that ought to be easy to carve. So I've just uh, ripped them to the right uh, thickness to uh, start carving. So we'll cut those pieces out and see how that works. Starting to uh, shape the uh, rowboat hulls. I'm going to mark it on the other side. It makes it easier to cut. The other piece. This is a piece I've already shaped. And I'm going to put the line on this side now. something to start carving out of. So now what I want to do is cut these down into pieces that are half the width of the hull because I want to glue a, a keel between two halves. I think that'll make it easy when to do this. 
So we want to set the cut to 9 sixteenths, which is half the hull. Looks like a, a good start on two skiffs. I'm uh, gluing up a piece of sixteenth of an inch pine between the two halves of the uh, boats and those will be the keel. It looks like it should work out reasonably well. So uh, once we get that done we can start carving the keel and uh, start shaping the, uh, uh, the rails. I've uh, cut out this piece up in this copy and I'm using it now as a template to mark a profile on the uh, rowboats. We'll cut that out after we mark this one. Well, the rowboats are now roughly shaped. We're ready to start carving them. So now I have to find a way to hold them in the vise while I carve them. So I think I'm going to drill a couple holes in on the uh, top side and insert some dowels that I can clamp in the vise. We'll see how that works. I've drilled uh, holes and put some dowels in so now we can hold them in the vise while we carve them. I'm going to start off trying not to glue these in. If I have to glue them on I can and I'll cut them off and, and grind them down afterwards but uh, we'll start out without the glue. And we'll see uh, how this starts to go here. Stay at that for a while and see what it starts to look like. I've been uh, carving and sanding on the uh, on the rowboat, and uh, I think it's starting to look uh, pretty decent. I think this one is probably ready for uh, a coat of uh, sanding primer to fill in uh, any pores in the wood. And then we'll, uh, after we get the sanding primer on it, we'll give it a coat of paint for color. In the meantime, we're going to start carving the next one. Well, we now have uh, two rowboats, and uh, we'll have to make cradles for them. <clears throat> and we have to uh, put a coat of primer on these so we can sand them out, getting them ready for paint. But uh, nonetheless, the uh, don't look too unconvincing for a couple of solid blocks of wood. 
Well, both the uh, boats are carved and sanded, and they've had a coat of sanding primer on them, and they're all sanded out from that. So they're nice and smooth, ready for paint. And uh, I don't know, my first thought was to paint it the same off, off white, creamy off white as the trim of the boat, but it's just kind of going to disappear in there. And they're, they're kind of a nice little detail. So I'm thinking about maybe making it a contrast in color. And uh, crazy, I got a, a spray can of a nice satin finish uh, burgundy color, uh, which is going to stand out pretty spectacular. And if I if I don't like it, like it after I see it in the boat, we can always repaint it to a different color. So we're going to give that a try. I've made uh, four cradles, two for each boat. Uh, with eye rings uh, glued in place. I'm going to give them a coat of uh, wipe on poly and then when the boat, uh, the paint job on the boats is, fin is uh, dry, I'm thinking it might be easier to tie these to the boat uh, before I try to glue it into the uh, ship. Uh, if I tie both of them onto, onto a boat and then put a little glue on the bottom, I should be able to set them right down in place and they'll stay put. It'd be a lot easier than trying to tie knots inside the ship, I think. Well, we just finished the rigging. And the last thing to go in are these lines here with the hooks on them that uh, run up to the mast and dive back down again. And they're used to haul the uh, skiffs in and out. And there's two on each side. And that's the end of the rigging. Now I, the skiffs are over here. And uh, I like the color. I think it's going to be add to the model. It's going to look nice. It's unfortunately this is satin paint, not a flat paint. And uh, it's got a little more gloss to it than I like. But uh, I'm going to put them in place and see what they look like. I, I'm not sure I'm going to go nuts. I like the color so much I don't want to try to screw it up by uh, flattening it out with uh, anything. So I'm just putting them in place and see what they look like. Uh, I've done a little work on the skiffs. Uh, this is a, as I sprayed it, this satin finish supposedly, but it's pretty glossy. But I was able to dull it down using a little uh, of the very fine steel wool. Uh, so I think that's more acceptable than the, than the shiny finish. Also, the problem is, if I put the uh, boat in on the deck, these things take up so much room in the boat that it's going to be hard to move fore and aft on the boat. So I think I'm only going to put one skiff on for the pilot to go from here to wherever he needs to go. I'm not going to put the second one on. It's not like a fishing boat where you have a whole bunch of skiffs that you're trying to put out to do fishing. So uh, I think one skiff on the pilot boat is going to be enough. And I think that dulls it down just enough that uh, we can get away with without uh, having to try and spray something on it to dull it out. I do like the color though. It adds a little bit of uh, interest to the uh, to the boat. Just finished installing all the loops of line that go over the belaying pins and uh, you can see them down here. Got a couple up front. So with the uh, all the rope loops installed at this point the uh, ship model is done. So now all we got to do is uh, build a display case. But we take one last picture of it all finished here before I put it into the uh, display case. I think she's a rather pretty boat. Just cut the first piece of the uh, display case, the base. <clears throat> it's 5 inches by 24. It gives me uh, two inches on either end of the boat for clearance and plenty of clearance side to side. So it's the beginning of the display case. It's a nice piece of red oak. It's 
starting to cut the red oak and uh, glue up the uh, base for the display case. I've got the uh, the end pieces all cut, ready to go on. This uh, quarter inch strip uh, gets a short piece glued on it that's just a little thicker than the plastic and that'll form an edge for the plastic to sit on and then the bull, bull nose will go on on the outside of that leaving a track for the plastic. Uh, it's the way I like to do them. They seem to work out pretty well that way. I've been working on the uh, base for the display cabinet and uh, <clears throat> the base consists of the three-quarter inch full width uh, plank on the bottom and then <clears throat> To that is glued a quarter of an inch wide piece as a frame all the way around <clears throat> that raises it up an extra three quarters of an inch thickness. It gives it a little depth, makes it uh, look nice. And then there's a five thirty second of an inch piece that spaces the groove for the plastic. That's uh, another frame glued to the outside. And then inside we've made up a piece of mitered molding three-quarter inch piece and rounded that over <clears throat> and then on the outside we've made a inch and a half by three-quarter inch bull nose uh, that goes all around the outside and then we've glued feet on the bottom of it. I like that because when you go to pick the model up you can get your hands underneath it rather easily. Makes it easy to move. Then over here I've cut the uprights for the display case and these are the grooves for the plastic sheets going in. I've given it one coat of wipe on poly. Uh, when that dries we'll flip it over and do the other two sides. So the next thing to do is uh, <clears throat> cut the pieces for the top frame and I've got standing over here piece that I've cut as an inch and an eighth wide by three quarters and I'm hoping that's going to make the top frame out of that. This board is uh, turning out to be a little disappointing. Uh, if you look down at here you can see uh, it's got a little wave to it. So I'm hoping to be able to get enough straight pieces out of this to get rid of the wave that's in there, make the top sit flat. Just cut the uh, pieces for the top frame of the display case. These uh, grooves are for the plastic sides <clears throat> to fit up into. And this piece on uh, rabbit on top is for the glass top to lay into. Uh, I like to put plastic on the sides because it's lightweight and doesn't break easily. And then I like to use glass on top because uh, the glass doesn't scratch easily when you clean the dust off it. Still continuing working on the uh, display case and I've mounted the four corner posts using uh, number six screws by two inches long and my setup for uh, drilling the holes in the posts, which I haven't done for the top yet, uh, is over here in the drill press. So got all the way down to there and we clamp the base in there keep it vertical while we're drilling the holes and I center punch them for the correct locations before I drill them so it's coming along rather nicely just mitered the uh, corners of the top frame <clears throat> and now I'm going to run the saw through the corners uh, so that we can put a, a splice of oak with the grain running across the miter because end grain to end grain is a very weak joint and uh, I want to put a, a spline in each of the corners running across so that the uh, corners will all have some strength because we're going to be putting screws down through into the uh, four corner posts. I want that to be nice and strong. This is a uh, fixture that I made the last time I made a display case and uh, 
it's going to hold the uh, frame pieces while we make the uh, cut for the spline. Now I've set the blade to the, uh, the height of the miter. You can see that. And uh, that should be about the same as I had it last time. So uh, I'm going to clamp that onto the, uh, the miter guide. And uh, we'll take, actually take a film of cutting the, splay, the uh, spline holes. I had to clamp the uh, fixture to the miter guide uh, so that it doesn't move around. And now I've lined it up with the marks on the plastic insert that show the width of the blade, which makes it always handy for setting things up. And uh, so now we're going to take the uh, frame pieces and hold them in the corner like that while we pass a saw cut through the miter. Okay, we'll cut one frame piece here. Now you can see where we've made slots to put splines through and we'll do that on the other three frame pieces. Alright, we've cut the uh, slots for the splines on all four corners of the frame. So now all we have to do is cut a set of splines that will fit those slots. I'm going to use a small table saw for that. It's just thick enough to fit into the slots. And this is how we're going to be uh, splining our corners together. When the uh, <clears throat> glue dries on the splines, I'll be trimming them out flush so that we won't be seeing them. Other than just a, a mark. At this point I've uh, sanded out the splines in the uh, top frame. and. Uh, Looks pretty good. Corners came out decent. Splines will disappear quite a little bit in there, but they give a lot of strength to those corners. And uh, I've countersunk the screws that are holding it in place. And all the uh, slots line up for the plastic nicely so that we'll be able to install the plastic properly. So the next thing we got to do <clears throat> is to uh, take this off, give it a coat of uh, poly, white poly, so finish on it. The uh, screw holes will get plugged and, and filled in after the plastic is in place. And right now I'm going to be taking measurements for the plastic and glass so that I can go get those cut. Just picked up the uh, plastic and the glass top for the case. Peel the uh, coating off the, one of the end pieces here. Looks like it's going to be fitting very nicely. And uh, I think the next thing I'm going to do is actually glue the uh, ship model into the base. I just put down a, a bead of glue here. I tried to stay in from the edges so it doesn't come oozing out uh, when I set the ship model in place. All right, the model is glued in place. It's nicely centered, even side to side. So all we have to do now is wait for that to dry. And we can peel the paper off the rest of the uh, plastic and start fitting that. Well, we're almost done. The uh, glazing all fits in nice. And uh, the only thing I can't uh, button it up just yet because I'm waiting for a brass name plaque to come. It's 
It's going to be a few days before that gets here. So uh, <clears throat> once I get the brass plaque uh, screwed down, which will be down here in the front, uh, I'll be able to uh, plug the screw holes in the top and seal everything up. Today the uh, brass plaque uh, that I ordered came and uh, I'm just trying a position out here for it. Got the Dancing Feather 1853 Boston Pilot Schooner. So I'm going to have to disassemble the frame, take the screws out of the top here, pull the front panel out. This one has no glass in it. And then we'll drill the holes and uh, it comes with a set of screws. So we'll screw that down. We should be able to reassemble the frame. Once I reassemble the frame, we'll be able to plug the screw holes, put a little bit of uh, wipe on poly, and the project will be done. Okay, our ship model is uh, fully enclosed in the case. We have our plaque in place. So now all I have to do is uh, plug the holes in the top and we'll, uh, the project will be done. The uh, clearance for the screw head is uh, 3 eighths of an inch. So uh, these are my plug cutters. So we're going to pick the 3 eighths plug cutter. Cut myself a set of plugs. Got the uh, plug cutter mounted in the drill, and I got a nice piece of oak, and we're going to cut ourselves some plugs. What we got to do now is cut those out, put them in the holes, cut them off flush, and finish them with a little poly. Well, we've glued the uh, plugs in all four of the screw holes, and uh, all we got to do now is wait for the glue to dry, take a little chisel and shave them off. Just uh, <clears throat> cut off the uh, plugs and uh, give it a light coat of poly so the case is now finished and the uh, Dancing Feather project is complete. Just thought I'd take a, a moment uh, here to uh, read a little bit of the uh, history of the pilot schooner uh, as it's presented here in the <coughs> instruction manual. Uh, Thought it might be nice to end this project uh, <clears throat> with a little bit of the history. It says the maritime nations of the world which have laws to regulate the comings and goings of ships in their harbors. Often these laws specify ships in local waters <clears throat> sail under the command of a local pilot, a special breed of ship captain acquainted with the immediate coast and harbor scene. The use of pilots to guide ships into harbor has been practiced in the United States for over 300 years. In 1873, the Commonwealth of Massachusetts passed legislations that authorized the governor and his council to appoint suitable persons as pilots for the several harbors of the Commonwealth, including Boston. The Boston Marine Society, founded in 1742, assumed responsibility for the regulation of pilotage in Massachusetts and continues to do so today. Hence the business of the pilot boat, which carries these inshore skippers, to and from their client vessels. The early pilot boats needed speed and seaworthiness to compete for available shift traffic. 
The Dancing Feather was designed by Dennison J. Lawler when he was apprenticed at the shipbuilding firm of Wind and Clinkard at East Boston. During his career, Lawler designed and built several noted pilot boats, including the Dancing Feather, Edward Forrest, Florence, Phantom, Lily, and Hesper. After working in the Boston area for some years, the Dancing Feather sailed to California, where it was engaged in the piloting salvage trades. Nothing further is known of the vessel after that period. The Dancing Feather measured 67 feet 6 inches in length and 19 feet 8 inch beam. Her lines and towering rigging about 3,000 square feet of sail were reminiscent of the famous Baltimore Clippers and so well to, suited to her business. The, 18, the Dancing Feather was built in 1853. This beautiful schooner had black top sides and green underbody and her billet handrails and trail boards picked, picked out with gold leaf. The Dancing Feather clipper bow that became popular in contemporary fishing schooners of the sharpshooter class, which undoubtedly added much to her beauty. The clipper bow was more in favor in the Boston, with the Boston pilots than in New York. However, the round stern of the plan of the Dancing Feather seems to have been a, an importation from New York, which annoyed enjoyed only a short popularity around Boston. The rig of the pilot schooners like Dancing Feather type was similar to that of the clipper fishing schooner. Fore and main top mass fitted with jib booms. That's it. That's the end of the day. End of part 12.